Hello Sofa Squad and welcome back to the damn sofa. That's the sofa. This is my sometimes dicey, all the time shady sidekick, Mr. Roscoe. And my name's Paul. Today we are going to be talking about a case that... Y'all, this is one of the most horrible ones that I have seen in a hot minute, okay? This case recently went to trial, recently wrapped up, and had literally everybody talking for the atrocities that this guy did to his parents. This case reminds me of Grand Amato. This case reminds me of Joel Guy Jr. The monster that we're going to be talking about today, his name is Chandler Halderson. Now, the victims, the direct victims, and I say the direct victims because I'm talking about specifically the two who lost their lives to him, were sadly his parents, Krista and Bart. Now, Here's the thing, when I say direct victims, I also think that there are a whole bunch of other victims in this case. And I'm talking about people who he victimized after the fact tried to cover up his absolutely heinous crimes. So what I would like to do today is to tell the story of Chandler Halterson, tell the story of Kristen Bart, and look at a lot of the aspects of the trial, offer my opinion, my thoughts, my commentary on those, specifically some of the testimony that we saw and some of the evidence that came forth, you know, videos from Ring Bell, um, the phone call that his father would end up having between uh, school counselors, Chandler's interview with the police, these things right there, because I think that they give us a peek inside a world that is honestly really hard to comprehend. Now, like I said, I consider there to be a lot of victims in this case, and we'll talk about some of them on that were, you know, on the stand even. Uh, but first, I want to talk with the two direct victims, the two people who lost their lives for absolutely no reason to their son. And again, their names are Krista and Balt, Bart Halderson. Chandler's father was 50 and his mother was 53. They had so many years ahead of them. Bart was a certified public accountant and tax manager in Madison, and his mom had been a stay-at-home mom while they were growing up, but had recently taken a job as a receptionist. Now, Chandler had been living with them. Person after person would describe them as wonderful people. Even the mother's boss would get up there and he would describe her as warm, empathetic, caring, great customer service rep for the customers. And you know, the customers absolutely love them. Now, even Krista's best friend would get on the stand and talk about, you know, their relationship, Krista and Bart's, the kids, you know, all that. She could barely keep it together when she was asked to describe what kind of parents they were. You were around these folks a lot with their kids. What kind of parents were Bart and Krista? Amazing. What do you mean by that? Now, not only did Chandler steal away his parents from the world and people who loved them and cared about them like we just saw, he also stole them away from his other brother, Mitchell. Now, Mitchell's the older son, and he wasn't living at home. He had moved out, he had an IT job, engaged, buying a home, all these kind of things. And he would describe his parents in a way that many people can relate to when describing their parents. And we'll talk about him and some of his testimony here in a little bit. Now, as for Chandler, he was doing a lot of things in life too. He was a college student. He was studying renewable resource engineering. He worked at American Family Insurance. He'd even gotten hired on at SpaceX. Now he was planning on moving to Titusville, Florida with his girlfriend. I want to talk about her in a little bit. And he was such a wonderful person that he worked with Madison Police and DNR on rescue diving teams. Now, unfortunately for poor little Chandler, recently he had suffered a major head injury and a fall. It, this is going to have permanent, horrifying, disabling injuries to it. Bless his little heart. However, there is something wrong with all the stuff that I just said. This sounds like a wonderful, wonderful human being I just described, but every single bit of it was a complete lie. Chandler was none of those things. Chandler was nothing like his brother who was actually a successful, living on their own kind of a person. Chandler didn't do anything. And now sadly, when Chandler's back would get pushed against the wall in the middle of all of these lies that he created, instead of owning up to it, moving on, starting new, something, he would lash out in such a grisly way that it's literally usually reserved for horror films. 
Now, an obvious question to ask yourself is why in God's name do this, right? The state will say that, look, you know what? This all came to a head. All these lies came to a head and he was going to be exposed. His basically his dad had called on to this and we'll talk more about that later. And his again, his back was against the wall and he was going to get exposed for this. And this would all come to a head. His secret life would come to the surface and seemingly he couldn't handle it. And the only way he thought he could handle it was by wiping his parents out, probably getting some of their insurance money and other things like that and continuing to do God knows what. Now all of these lies and this turmoil and all these issues would all come to the surface in July of 2021. But what I expect to prove beyond any reasonable doubt is that on July 1st, 2021, somewhere between 3 p.m and 5 p.m., Chandler Halderson murdered his parents. It's an important date, and it's an important time to remember. July 1st, between 3 and 5. Now, here's the thing. Chandler would have like a week between when he did this horrible act to his parents July 1st and when this would be discovered July 8th. And it's what he did in that in-between time during that week, in addition to obviously what he did to his parents, but this is what will send shivers down your spine. But the story doesn't start there. And this trial wouldn't be three to four weeks if the trial ended there. The story starts a week later on July 7th, 2021, nearly a week after killing his parents, but no one in the world knowing, Chandler Halderson walks into the Northeast Precinct of the Dane County Sheriff's Office and says, I'd like to file a missing persons report. Now the state's opening in this case was so beautifully crafted it told such a story of the chain of events that took place in such a way it was very moving. It was one of those openings where you were like, oh my God, like, first of all, what are we getting ready to hear, right? In addition to that, this courtroom was so well run. The judge was so mannerly in this case. He just ran everything. It was very boom, boom, boom. This is how this goes. There was no drama from him. He was respectful to everybody and it really worked well. Another thing that would take place in this trial is that the defense wouldn't really have too much to say throughout the trial. There wouldn't be many objections. They weren't, you know, going back and forth with the uh, people in the stand, the witnesses and whatnot. So this allowed the state to present their case almost all the way through, right? And we just usually don't see this type of a situation. So the case that was presented by the state was very well organized. The story that they told in their opening, they had evidence all along the way. They had dotted their I's and crossed their T's and it really showed in this case. Now, as you can imagine, after really good openings by the state and that kind of thing, the defense in this one, they didn't have too much to say. Chandler Halderson, did not murder his parents. He is not guilty of those crimes. Now I will have to give it to the defense though, because as we get into this trial and see the evidence presented, I mean, yeah, there's like really very little they could say, right? This is one of those where the defense is literally there to just make sure that the defendant's constitutional rights are protected throughout the questioning and things of that nature, because the evidence is so utterly overwhelming against him. He likes to play video games, play with his dogs, hang out with his girlfriend, and he lived peacefully in his parents' home. He was just a normal kid. He is a normal kid. I kind of feel like they're stretching it a little bit with the normal kid thing, but I mean, I get it. They gotta do what they gotta do. So what did happen? What happened to the Haldersons? What happened in that Haldersons home. I personally am dying to know what she has to say about this, so please proceed. Remember those questions. They won't be answered at the end of this trial. Okay, so now I think I have more questions, more unanswered things. What are we trying to say happened? They just told you what they think happened. We heard a lot of detail of the before and a lot of detail of the 
after. But a one or two simple sentences, and then he killed his parents. The evidence will show you that there is a gap of evidence when it comes to that time frame. Yeah, that wasn't what I was looking for. <sighs> Again, everyone deserves a defense, right? They didn't have much to work with in this, okay? Because the evidence, as we will look at it and see, there's really no gap. I mean, circumstantially even, I mean, this one's like, yeah, he's, he's uh, very guilty. So if all of this is up in the air and these gaps of evidence and no one knows what really happened, then let's start where the prosecution suggests that we start on July 7th. Let's start with the missing persons report and see what takes place as that unfolds from there. So as we heard, uh, Chandler will walk into the police station and he won't actually call them, he'll walk in and he'll tell them that he wants to file a missing persons report. Now, as we heard the state say, you know, he already had a week to attempt to clean up and hide what he had done, okay? Now, just one of the things that went wrong with his little plan is after he did this, he was going to dispose of the parents' bodies and the dump, but it was closed. It was a holiday weekend, right? So this would throw him into a tailspin. The choices that he made, in addition to the horrifying ones that he made, were so asinine and stupid that I don't honestly have any idea how he thought he would ever get away with it, or if that maybe even crossed his mind at that point. So Chandler goes into the station and he has this story. He's like, look, you know, my parents were going to their cabin up in White Lake and they should have been back by now. And so obviously this is concerning, right? So he kind of peddles the story of, well, you know what? They were going up there with, you know, some friends. I wasn't really sure who. Um, I didn't 100% ask. And when I got up, they, you know, he gets up at like six o'clock in the morning to take care of the dogs and the parents were already gone. Now he'll try and line things up and he'll be like, well, you know, I'd helped him pack the car the day before and we had packed, you know, a bunch of booze and different tools and whatnot. Now, a lot of the tools that he would say they took up there to like work on stuff at the cabin were actually like things that he seemingly had used to dispose of their bodies himself. So he was trying to cover his tracks in the sense of doing that, right? Now other things were weird with the story. You know, the parents' car is still at the home, they didn't take it, well they must have ridden with a friend. All of these things just aren't lining up, right? The, the, this is very weird to these police officers. Now Chandler would even show the officers a text message that his mom had sent them, sent him. And it was like, hey, we made it, you know, we'll be back, whatever, very short and to the point. Now he would claim that this made him not really question why they had been gone or whatever. Now as the case will unfold on the stand, we will learn that officers eventually find his mother's cell phone and it is wrapped in foil, it's hidden at the house. So in addition to other stuff we're gonna look at, Chandler was very good at covering his tracks in this way, right? But not good enough to fool the police officers. So then the cops basically decide, you know what, this cabin needs to be looked at, right? This is allegedly where they were at the last time. So they contact local police in that area where the cabin's at. And on July 8th, the officer will meet up with Mitchell. Remember, this is Chandler's brother, Mitchell and his fiance. Now, this is a property that's been in their family since like, I think the 1940s. It's a place that the parents would go often. But when they arrive there and the police and all them meet up there, it doesn't look like anyone's been there, right? They search the whole place up and down. It looks closed up. Mitchell allows them to like get into every structure there. But it's very clear that the parents, they haven't been there. Now at this point, I can't imagine what was going on through Mitchell's mind, right? I mean, he had to be so worried. And speaking of Mitchell, let's go ahead and take a moment and look at what he had to say while he was on the stand about his parents. Describe what was your dad like as a parent, just very briefly. Well, he worked a lot, so slightly absent during the time, but I would say had good expectations for us and overall was a good parent. A uh, bit of the typical helicopter parent, very involved in our everyday lives, but again, for the, because she cared. This is absolutely a normal way to describe most parents, right? This sounds like most everybody's mom and dad for the most part, right? A lot of people could describe their parents as this mom worries too much, dad works too much, 
You know what I'm saying? So within reason on both. There was nothing up there that would make one think, oh my God, what horrible people these are. So, and again, you know, my heart goes out to people like this, like Mitchell and other people will talk about having to get on the stand and recount this. Looking at your own brother feet away from you and then seeing the evidence of what he did to their parents, I, I cannot imagine. Now, when Mitchell was on the stand, he would talk about being diagnosed with diabetes, how his mom was overly concerned, Later in the trial, we'll be able to put two and two together and hear evidence that will show us how Chandler was able to see the amount of attention and worry that his brother was getting over this legitimate situation going on, right? And we'll be able to see how Mitch or uh, Chandler will pick things from other people that he'll use to his benefits to make up lies about himself. If you've ever encountered somebody who completely falsifies their life or aspects of it and lies like this, you'll see these patterns where they'll do that. There's a kernel of truth. It's usually not their truth. And this is literally how Chandler lived his everyday life, was taking other people's truths and using them to his advantage. Now, Mitchell will say that his parents would have told them if they were going to the cabin. Now, he too will testify to he thought Chandler worked for American Family family insurance. He thought Chandler was on online school. Mitchell would also confirm that there were life insurance policies that he and Chandler were beneficiaries on and these came up to quite a pretty sum of money. Now another absolutely cringe worthy aspect of the evidence that comes up is technology. Okay, this was not Chandler's forte. When it comes to trying to cover your tracks, literally he could write a book on how not to do it because he literally did every cliche there is possible. So let's start off by looking at some of the ring video footage from neighbors. So Chandler thought it was a good idea to go around to the neighbor's houses that had the ring bell, that's what I call it. Uh, for those who don't know what this is, this is basically like a video intercom doorbell so that you can see who's there. So if somebody comes up, it's recording what goes on. These do not work to criminals advantage in these days, right? Especially ones like Chandler. So we'll learn through testimony that, you know, when he was covering this up and doing what he was doing, there were coming and goings from the house and all this kind of stuff. So he thinks is going to be a smart idea to go knock on people's doors and again I can see how everybody I mean this would be a normal thing to do if your parents possibly went missing but he's going around and he's you know asking like hey do you have you know did your did your camera go to our house and all this kind of stuff what's really creepy about it is knowing what we know now right and seeing whoa like this is so calculated on his part I'm actually kind of surprised he was smart enough to do it um but then also, like, my God, these people had this, like, total psycho, you know, some of them even had let him come in the house because they didn't know, right? But this would make him look like such a clown in court because it's so obvious what he's doing hindsight-wise. Hi, my name is Chandler Halderson. I live just down the road. Oh, yeah. You're the one who thought of the police. Yeah. I was told you the anti-security system. I was wondering if you were able to capture the road or my house. Um, the, uh, the police actually came and, and downloaded everything they have. But it, it's actually my sister's house. Oh, okay. Yeah, so they were here, I think, till like 9 o'clock last night and downloaded all the video she's got. So we're hoping that... Yeah, did it capture anything on... We don't know. We don't know. They just took a copy of everything, and okay. so we're hoping. Lining the lens. Yeah, and it's all HD. Yeah, and it's all HD. And then I think there's one. Um, Especially in the dark, it looks like it has a little bit of night vision. Yeah, and there's one on the uh, the corner of the garage too. Um, I don't know if that one quite goes that direction, but. Maybe see this road and take this road. Yeah, so hopefully, I mean, they, we give them everything that we had, so we're hoping we find something on there. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. 
you know when she was like, the cops have all that, da 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 I mean, you know he was dying, right? Because he had done this horrible thing, done all this stuff, and now he's running around and finding out, yep, the cops have this, the cops have that, and he's it's so interesting, he's trying to act like, oh yeah, it looks like he's got some uh, infrared stuff there. You know, and I'm just like, you haven't even, if you did take a class in this at your little community college, you flunked out of it. We know that because the evidence speaks for itself. Also, Google searches were not Chandler's friend. When this was going down, like after the fact or whatever, you know, he had gone to the cops and stuff, they would find out that he was Google searching things like woman's dismembered body, Wisconsin, woman's body found. I will never understand people who try and Google their crimes. I, I mean, I just don't understand it at this point in time. And I get the temptation to want to Google it. Trust me, I get it, right? I'm hooked on Google myself. If I had done this, I would hope to think I could refrain from Googling the exact thing that I did in the area that I did it the way that I did it, do it, you know, did it. Um, I just, it, I can't wrap my mind around that. But again, I can't wrap my mind around most of this stuff, right? Now, he wasn't going to leave it there. He even went as far as to do TV interviews. The, all I would really want to ask you is just if there's any information that you feel like, you know, would be worthwhile for us to share, anything that you feel like is, is important for us to share, just anything, anything like that, of that mm -hmm. nature. Um, so my last uh, message I got from them, they were going to White Lake for the 4th of July. There's some festivities that go around there, you know, better drink prices at the bars, mm -hmm. stuff like that for, um, yeah, White Lake, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Um, other than that, their plan, or from, to my knowledge, they're going to Langlade County to a cabin, uh, their cabin. Uh, now he would have you believe that they would pack up everything, drive hours away to get, you know, ladies night free drink somewhere, right? Now we would hear on the stand that the, yes, the father's an accountant. He can, you know, kind of pinch pennies here and there and all that. But right there when he's like, you know, oh yeah, there's better drink prices. I was like, mm -mm, I'm not, you know, because we've also heard from other people that the parents weren't like these insane drinkers either, right? So that right there, but it's also whenever we hear these interviews that these people do, right? These people meaning these like psycho killers that take their families out. Um, it's always interesting to me how they just are speaking so nonchalantly, you know, knowing the mental image in their mind of what they have done. And they're just, you know, well, yeah, I think they were going to the lake, the, the cabin at the lake. And they left then a week ago today on the first Friday, Friday. Friday morning. So that would have been the second right of July when they left. Yes. And that's the last you'd heard of them. Yes, it is. And then was it yesterday that you called the sheriff's office or someone with your family called the sheriff's office just to... I, 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 go back on that. Norris. I actually um, got a text from them on Sunday telling me they were going to White Lake. Okay. I don't know when the text was sent because of reception issues that they would have. And they usually turn their phone off because of pay for roaming. Yeah. Um, we, they, it could have been whenever they sent that message that they made it safely and they're going to White Lake for the fourth. Okay. Again, he's so calm when he says this stuff, and it kind of gives you a clue if this is how he was with his parents and most anybody, but especially the parents, because that's one thing that's central to this is how deep his lies ran, and he just seems to be able to seemingly remain calm and lie about everything under duress, right? Uh, and then even corrects himself, oh wait, you know, that comment, uh, they actually, they had sent me a text. Now, we know at this point that he was the one that sent the text, right? So it's that little part of him that I'm just like, yeah, this one is absolutely cray cray and then the other thing i wanted to ask you about was <clears throat> the a lot of the comments people were concerned or kind of wanted some clarification about the vehicle right because the reports mm -hmm. from the sheriff's office say they, they didn't have a car or there wasn't a car with them it they was, brought or they were picked up by their friends okay who i never got the name of and i i assumed it was someone i was aware of like uh, close neighbors of theirs up the street or um, their best friends down on the east side so that's what I assumed I never really asked any further in it to, into it and so they got picked up and they all went up there 
by like another couple. Picked up here? Yeah, here. Yeah. Now the part that sounds believable to me about this is that I can see some aloof. My mind wants to say teenager, but this guy was like 23 years old, right? But regardless, he strikes me as a type that would always be this way. Just being completely, eh, whatever, they're going up there. You know, they went with some friends or whatever. The part that, you know, and again, each family is different or whatever. So, you know, we don't 100% know how they all functioned. It seems very odd to me that the parents wouldn't have been more like, oh, here we are, you know, and granted, he tried to cover that with the text message that he got, but it just seems very odd that they would have just up and left in this manner, right? But again, he was surprised by not being able to get rid of them in the way that he wanted to. So he probably had to improvise a little bit. Now, even if he had been able to get rid of them the way he wanted to, he was still going to have to come up with this whole thing because his parents were active people, right? I mean, they had jobs, they did stuff. People were expecting to see them. So all of a sudden, they're going to disappear off the face of the planet you know, when he's going to be seen on numerous things, you know, going to and from, and you know, they went in the house, but they never left again. And that's going to be plainly obvious eventually. Now, as you've seen so far, lies came so easily to Chandler. Nobody was immune to them, right? Not even the alleged love of his life, his girlfriend, Kat. So in the trial, we'll hear from Chandler's girlfriend, Kat. Now we're also gonna hear from her mother, Dulce, and her mother's girlfriend, Cress. Now, Dulce and Cress lived on a farm with Cress's father. It was her father's property. She, you know, he was much older. She was kind of running things. And they would describe this place as like a haven. And the pictures that they showed, it did look like, if you're into living out in the country and like, you know, that kind of thing, having acreage and whatnot, I mean, it looked like a little slice of heaven on earth. But what we will learn happened on that property after he did these horrible things to his parents is just absolutely what nightmares are out of, made out of and literally would probably taint that place for the rest of everyone's lives that knew it. So Kat and Chandler have been going together since August 2019. They met through friends and they were like any other young couple. They went to movies, dinners, long walks. They texted, Snapchatted, FaceTimed, all this kind of stuff, right? Now when asked to describe her relationship with his family, she would break down, right? I mean, and uh, God bless her for getting up there and doing that. I cannot imagine what was going through her mind when she learned all this, right? But she would say, you know what, I texted with his parents a lot. We were all close. We were, you know, these were wonderful, lovely people. Now, like most people, she was like, yeah, I wanted, you know, to be dating somebody who was self-sufficient with a job, a place to live, all this kind of stuff. You know, the things that she would offer somebody, right? She too thought all this same stuff of Chandler that he was selling her. Now, she was thinking that they were going to be moving to Florida to get an apartment and, you know, he's going to have this fancy job at SpaceX and, you know, he had this paid internship and all this crazy stuff, right? He would also tell her about how he was, you know, volunteer with the Madison Police Department and for the scuba diving and, you know, do all these wonderful things. Literally, the life she was building with this guy was completely false, but she had no clue about that until it all came crashing down. Now, on the stand, Kat will say, you know what, we were planning on spending that weekend together, and she would get a text from him, and he was basically like, well, look, come over and have dinner, but then you're going to have to go home, and then you can come back and spend the rest of the weekend. And she was like, well, that's weird, because why would I do that? Like, I'm, like I'm already there, right? This doesn't make sense. And she's like, what's up? And he's like, well, I have some chores to do. And sadly, at this point, we now know what those chores were. Now, she said that July 3rd morning, he told her he was going to go do some chores. But later, when she looked at his Snapchat location, it was like in this weird spot in the woods. So she screenshotted this. And she would eventually show this to the cops, like when things started going down. Now, the police would eventually go and search this area that he was at on her Snapchat. And horrifyingly, this is where they would find the remains of Chandler's mother. I guess you could say maybe just parts of her remains because all of them were never found. So Kat was at the house this weekend after this cleanup, after all this, and she would recount on the stand how she showed up and there was a smell of fire in the home. And one of the glass panels on the fireplace was, was broken, it was gone. And he would tell her, oh, I was playing fetch with the dog and broke the glass out. And that's what happened. And, you know, of course, she doesn't think anything of it, right? And they keep going on. Now, we would later hear in testimony that the reason that shattered is because the fireplace had gotten so hot because he was trying to burn 
the body parts of his parents in that fireplace and it would end up making the glass explode in that one. Cat would spend the weekend with the man she was building this life with, sleeping feet away from the fireplace where the body parts of his parents had been burned and where they will find teeth, bone fragments, things that would let them know for sure that that is what that fireplace had been turned into. Now, like I said, the wrath of Chandler and his lies extended way beyond just his immediate people. And it reached Kat's mother. Her name was Dulce and she took the stand. And again, my heart broke for her. You could tell she was totally traumatized by this. Absolutely humiliated to have to share her personal details on the stand with the world, right? I mean, who wouldn't be? Um, but she would get up there and recount this. And one thing that I noticed right away is the way that she talked about Chandler. It was like she didn't know any different. He worked at American Family. He did this. I mean, this is just what she accepted anybody would, right? You never think someone has lied to this degree. And she almost spoke of him in this way of like, it just, it, it she couldn't grasp it, right? And so that really just struck a chord with me because I was like, God, this guy, I mean, what a horrible, horrible thing for him to have done and just exposed all these people to this absolute nightmare that he created. Now her girlfriend, Cress, now remember Cress is the one whose father owns the farm. She will take the stand too. And again, a very straightforward woman, you know, takes, seems like she probably took people at their word, that kind of a thing. So Cress will recount how that holiday weekend that, you know, the kids had come over, doing the holiday thing, all that kind of stuff. And at that point, you know, Chandler had asked or talked to her about, you know, oh, could I come back over at some point to use the pool that was offered? Now, remember, he's telling everybody that he has these horrible injuries from this fall he took down the stairs at home, right? And I mean, y'all, he was gonna, he's gonna wear a colostomy bag, nerve damage, this and that and the other. I mean, you would have thought he had survived, you know, a grenade going off on his body, right? I mean, just hamming it up. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. But, so she's like, yeah, you know, sure. I mean, who wouldn't say no? Well, the next damn day, you know, they look out the window and Chandler's there and they're like, oh, that's weird. Okay. Yeah, but hey, we offered here. You are. Sure. And so Chandler would be like, hey, you mind if I use the pool? Sure, go ahead. Now, the pool is in such a way at this place that it wasn't like right out front. It was almost like up a little further up this like hill, this driveway or whatever. So you kind of have to like go to it. And there was other structures out there. There was like a bar. And remember, this is like way out in the woods, right? Now, this is a very hot day. This is July. So Cress had been doing work and all this kind of stuff. And she's wanting to get into the pool. And we'll learn that, you know, she likes to go topless in the pool. And don't blame her. Um, so she's like, want to do this. Well, obviously they're like, where's Chandler? Where's Chandler? So eventually they will take the little Ryan lawnmower and go up and they're like, well, why is this car parked in this weird place out here, you know, near the barn with the thing open and all this. And he'll kind of come out like he's been in the woods over there. Right. And so this is very weird or whatever. Now, during this time, they, her and Dulce, they would have gone ahead and gotten in the pool, right? So Cress is in there, shirt off, and then this is finally when Chandler comes back, right? Now, what they do not know is that he has been in the woods disposing or attempting to dispose of his father's torso. He'll come up, he'll ask to get in the pool, you know, Cress is topless, and uh, for Dulce, you can tell she was very embarrassed to say this on the stand. Um, and I felt so bad for her during that because I'm like, girl, it's your, it's y'all's house. Get in there, but naked if you want to. Um, you know, but I, I understand that. I respect that. Um, her embarrassment. Um, so she's kind of like, oh my God. And Chris is like, well, look, whatever. They have no idea that he is wanting to get in there to wash blood off of his body and clean himself up, right? So she'll say, yeah, he was acting very weird, very odd, you know, and his behavior. And he's kind of telling, you know, talking about the, oh, the, the, my injuries and SpaceX is falling through and this and that. And it's to the point that they'll mention like, you know, are you on drugs? Like, what's up? And he's like, no, I'd never bring drugs here. And it's like, but you'll dispose of your father's torso in the woods. Okay, that makes sense. Now, in addition to the father's torso in the woods, he would dump off all the tools that he used to do this 
in the barn there, right? So the state would outline, I mean, an absolutely grisly scene when the forensic scientists took the stand. And there would be a discussion on the DNA and the daunting task of outlining which parent's DNA was found on what tool. And literally there was very little left to the imagination while they're up there describing tools commonly used to saw branches trim weeds, yard work, if you will. But it was clear what Chandler had used them for as bits of his parents and their DNA were left on the blades. Now, as you can imagine, lies like this, they all start to add up and compound, right? You gotta keep track of lie on top of lie on top of lie on top of lie. And so this would start happening to Chandler. His world would get smaller. And in usual Chandler fashion, he would reach out to the very people that would end up putting him away, trying to find out what information they have on him. So let's go ahead and listen to a phone call between him and one of the detectives. Um, a little confused. Uh, I got two squads parked right outside my house and they're not really canvassing, they're just kind of sitting there. Is everything all right? Yeah, I mean, they're in the area doing canvassing and they're also uh, probably doing a shift change right now, getting our second shift crew on around 3, 3.30. Oh, there's four now. I mean, my God, he sounds so guilty, so paranoid. Now we know at this point, right, that the cops, I mean, Two and two have come together, okay? So all of a sudden these cop cars that are out there, yeah, you know, your, your world's getting ready to change, right? Thank God it did. Um, but again, it's his level of paranoia that I'm just like, what did you think was ever gonna happen? I mean, why would you even do that? You know, number one, the act that he did, obviously, but then calling the cops there, I mean, and it just, it gets worse, so let's keep going. Nothing going on that we need to know? Well, they're probably doing reports, they're probably doing shift change. You know, they've, they've been going around trying to get all the neighbors, so I'm wondering if they're in the area trying to catch people now that they're coming home from work. I'm not sure. I haven't talked to any of them in just a little while. Is there something we need to know? I mean, go ahead and just turn yourself in, right? Phone call like that, even like say he hadn't done it, I'm like, then we're getting ready to see a wrongful conviction over this. Why would you call and sound like that if you were innocent? Like, that's where the, this just all falls apart. Like, none of this was ever going to work out for him, right? Like, there was just absolutely no way. But again, like with most of these idiots who do these horrific things, I don't think they think one step ahead. All he knew in the moment is, I'm getting ready to get called by dad. We have to get rid of that. And then after that, it was, oh, wait, now I need to think of this. Um, I can't. There's no mail. Uh, I got a, a, there's a, a hold on my mail. Okay. Uh, is, that, is that normal? I, are you guys getting it at least? No, we, we don't put a hold on people's mail. I've never heard of that happening before. There's a hold on my mail. There's a ticket in there. All mail held at the station is what it says. Okay. Yeah, nothing done by us, that's for sure. Because I'm going to need my medical bills. Yeah. No, we wouldn't put a hold on people's mail, and typically only the people that live at the address can do that. Now, he's even convinced that they have infiltrated his mailbox, right? I mean, he is, like, eating up with paranoia. So, I don't know. It's kind of stressful. Sorry, I, so there's nothing new going on? Not that I'm aware of. All right. Yeah. Who, who's right. there? Are you at home still right now, obviously? Because you're saying they're outside. Who's there with you? Yeah, no, not they're not with me. They're just four squads just parked outside. Okay. Who was just talking in the background, Cat? Yeah, Cat's over with me. Oh, okay. Okay. No, I mean, I can definitely give you a call or message you, I guess, depending. What time are you planning on going to dinner? Uh, I'm not sure, but... Okay. Pretty soon here. It's kind of stressful. Is there anything new going on? Yeah, we're getting ready to arrest you. I mean, honestly, right? I mean, and the the, the activists in there saying, oh, it's kind of stressful. You poor little thing. I mean, I cannot even. The fact that the detectives were so calm and collected during the interview that we're getting ready to watch, hats are off to them. Yeah. Um, oh, any news about that, that blue house with the big cameras? The blue house with the big cameras. Is that the one across the street? Yeah. yeah, across the street, kind of in the corner. It's a newer house. 
Um, I haven't I talked to... I stopped by the house. Yeah, I have a detective that's getting footage from the area. I don't know exactly which houses he's gotten video from oh. yet. But yeah, he's there's... Like they downloaded all of it and already have it at IT. Oh, okay. So he's probably reviewing it now. Okay. Yeah. He literally could have summed this entire phone call up in one sentence. When the cop answered, he could have been like, am I in trouble? Or do you have any evidence against me? Like those two things right there. Because that's all these questions are right here, right? Now, as we know by now, especially if you've watched the trial, all of this would lead to a little bit of an interview with Mr. Chandler. It's time to buckle those sofa seat belts because uh, this one's going to be a rough ride. Here's a downstairs okay. in the bedroom with the TV. I tossed the ball and I smashed the glass. Okay. With the dog. The dog so, uh, that. Yeah, set my dad off and we tried to clean it up. Okay. I don't know about him, but I got injured. Um, but he was mad. He didn't really talk to me too much that day. Now, call me petty and call me bitter, but just that little bit right there, I'm just like, what's wrong with him? I mean, besides the obvious of what he did to his parents, right? But I'm just like, there's like, this guy's weird, right? I mean, there's just something like, there is like nothing going on up here, right? He kind of seems like the type of person that would do this. You know what I'm saying? Like at this point, I'm like, yeah, this is what I'm seeing in that interview. I'm not surprised. Obviously during the interview, so let's kind of put ourselves where he's at. He is paranoid. He's been brought in. We heard the phone call, right? So he's probably thinking I'm caught, whatever. Now, the things that are interesting about this interview is number one, how he tries to come up with things all along the way to make excuses. So in here, we're hearing him say, this is why the glass is broken. It made dad mad. I, don't, I got injured. I don't know if dad did. Now we know at some point during all this, right, that he did get injured. I mean, there's like, there's evidence of this. So he has that going. Now, as we get deeper into this interview, what will be interesting is how he tries to account for blood, people's blood being everywhere. He's getting games, YouTube maybe. Uh, that's when I came across one of the jobs I liked. Um, then five o'clock rolled by and we, mom came home. Um, dinner. What do you guys have Wednesday night? I couldn't tell you. Okay. Who made it? I think it was probably just stuff from the fridge. Okay. I, don't, I think we all did our own thing again. Sure. Now, again, the way that he's speaking is almost like, and I don't know if he talks like this, where he kind of utters things in, in complete sentences, like dinner. You know, and that just blank stare that he has that I just feel like could just pierce through your soul, right? But listening to it, him talk, I'm just like, uh, you can almost tell during this where he is utilizing things that might have happened in the past to try and like play it off as then and then where and we'll see this even more prevalent where it's almost like he's just he can't keep up with his lies he's going blank there's like this like i i i don't I'm, my wheels are spinning here by the way a detective at my house said something's happened and while we were leaving people were going inside is there a warrant for my house should there be? No, I'm just wondering if... Okay. Can we um, go in? As far as I know, they were at your house and they were going to be there talking to you to ask if you would come up here and talk yeah, to us. Yeah, but um, Officer Haley just like walked pretty much in to the gate, you know, the gate on the outside. Mm -hmm. She just kind of walked in. I was, I was wondering... If was that when warm. you were getting your wallet? Uh, no, we were... We were, um, I was in the car waiting to leave. I was just wondering if everything's okay. Because okay. she said something's happened. Okay. And we need to go down. Again, wrap it up. I mean, done. A detective was going in the house and said that there was something. Is there a warrant? And I love it. Should there be? You know, and I'm just like, why would you ask that at this point? Like, unless you're just like, I'm done. I want. I did it, y'all. I want to save y'all the, the energy, the money, all that kind of stuff. State resources. I'm helping you out, too. Guilty. I feel like they argued a little bit after. Parents did? What were they arguing about? Probably what set my dad off that day, the glass. Okay. Um, us not having food ready 
and stuff like that. We, I mean, we just microwave whatever is in the fridge, I suppose. Yeah. Who was upset about that? Dad. Dad was? Okay. Yeah, he usually doesn't like that. We, he likes the, when we cook. Okay. Well, I, okay. Does he ever cook? I haven't seen him cook. Oh, he grills. He, he likes to grill. He grilled on Thursday. Nice. Right. Uh, I think I told one officer the green egg. Now, the part that stuck out to me about this little clip right here is when he's talking about, first of all, oh, what's up my dad off about the, the glass window? That's a lie, right? Um, but then I was like, I wonder how often his parents argued over him. Like, that was one of the things that I was like, I wonder behind closed doors how often the parents were arguing over him. Because, you know, this brings up another thing of, I feel like, Along the way, there had to be signs, right? The the amount of lying that this guy did, this is on major stuff. So God only knows what he was lying about in little day-to-day -day activities, right? And so if you look back at some of these other cases, like Grant Amato, for example, look at how the family tried to keep that secret. And then it would, when that whole situation would leak out and he'd like rip the ant off or someone else off, they would go and cover it up for him, like whatever they needed to do. So it made me wonder in this, you know, behind closed doors were his parents arguing over all the BS. Cause you know, this kid, uh, he brought a lot of BS with him, right? Now also just complete side note, when he is talking about cooking dad grills i was like Ugh. like Ugh. you know that part i was like oh my god i just you know, the the mental visions of that 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 conjured i'm like i can't i just can't with this he went back to work we planned on uh, something went well Oh, we were, um, I don't know, something went well for him, so that's all. Yeah, that's, this is bad. This is embarrassing. This is really embarrassing. Okay, he's literally just like making ish up along the way, okay. Um, and stuff, um, Played, played a video game called Tarkov for, until midnight. Well, after midnight, maybe even. Kind of lose track of time. And my parents by then were asleep. We got the toothbrush and everything. Um, Another bit of evidence that would come back to bite him in the butt is video cameras from a neighbor's house across the pond and they would catch from a window from Chandler's house a fire flickering and they literally spent a good amount of time and this is where I talk about the defense or the, I'm sorry the um the state did such a dynamic job in this because they brought in all these people to explain how the video camera worked, the pixels, the house layout, da, 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 da. because just looking at it, it's kind of confusing. But once they set all this evidence up on the stand and then show you, you're like, yeah, my God, that's a fire burning. And you know, at this point, what's in that fire? I mean, it literally just sends goosebumps down my arms, right? So after our movie, we set up my, my couch bed and um, the pillows for the girls. Who helped you set the bed up? My dad. Dad, okay. Yes. He knew he was leaving and I would need that. Now again, this is like one of those examples where I think that this probably took place before. Yeah, because he's basically saying that he would sleep on this couch bed thing that was in the room where the fire took place. And I remember this is where his girlfriend would sleep also later, uh, one night he'll say. Uh, but this is one of those things where I think he takes some things and just, you know, pretends that it happened that night. Cat Friday night, I believe. What'd you do Friday during the day? Oh, oh yeah, let's work backwards. Um, I kind of shit the day away. I play video games. Okay. Parents are gone, why not, right? Yeah, I didn't do anything that I should have. I should have been cleaning and all of that. I should have been cleaning. I mean, again, knowing what we know now, I'm like... And it does make me wonder, in all of this mess, you know that his poor parents were probably sitting there 
on the ground where he left them at parts where he's just playing video games covered in blood. I mean, you know, the act that he did to them to get rid of them is exhausting and draining and probably took a long time. And I'm sure he took breaks and did stuff like that and it probably didn't even phase him, right? Now, one thing during this is when the cop says, well, your parents are gone, why not? In reference to playing the games. I really felt like he was kind of saying that because the cops know at this point what happened, right? I mean, you know, with that reason. They know the parents aren't coming back. So that part I was like, oh, that is so creepy. And how he just keeps going on and on with this line of BS that he's telling them. She, um, I believe she stayed with me on that couch that night. So she spent the night over. Yeah. Poor cat. Can you imagine knowing that in your mind, your boyfriend's parents were stuffed in that fireplace that you were feet away from. I, I I cannot. I mean, that would literally set me back for years. In the morning, I'm a little worried about my family. I think I called my mom. Oh, throughout, I've called. I, I don't know the times, though. Throughout the weekend, I mean. But I called my mom, I believe, in the morning. There's along those lines and I get a text from her it was a text message it wasn't even my message so mm -hmm. I assume she said White Lake today so she sent it that day um, I couldn't figure out where she was because it was a text there was no I message so I kind of just like left it at that they're safe they're alive the fact that we know he's lying about all this, right? And then he says, I just love to do that. They're safe. They're alive. I'm just like, I mean, it's almost like he's trolling us, right? I'm just like, why would you even choose to say that? But I mean, he's just trying to make himself look better. I get that. Uh, but it just makes him even more creepier. All right. Well, at the end of the day on Monday, I did go for the afternoon. I did go to the farm to talk to Cress and Kat's mom. I told them what's happening with my health because I had the appointment at two. Did you go to the farm before or after, after the farm? Because okay. I told them what happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I told them the legs are probably going to be permanent and the headaches should be fixed after the hemorrhage is cleared a little bit. I mean, my. 23 year old able-bodied male gonna sit here and have you think that I mean his entire world has been wrecked over a slip down the stairs which you know at this point he did not really fall down those stairs right you don't even have to tell me twice he faked that whole thing I don't care if somebody saw him he fell on purpose and the level of injuries that he is claiming now here's the other thing that I'm just like how embarrassing right because you know during this like when it went down that they were like yeah this is BS but they would have a doctor on the stand that had attended to him when all this went down or whatever. And the cops would get subpoenas to his medical records. And I mean, literally y'all, it was like, yeah, it was like maybe a mild concussion. Like we basically had to name it something. So we said that, but all this long-term stuff, all this crazy stuff he's talking about, it was like, no, that's ab absolutely not. Now, one of the reasons why Chandler would go down that route, and again, with people who lie about their lives like this, they have to make one lie up to cover the last one, right? And it's this tailspin that they go into. So, obviously, Chandler has told his girlfriend, all these people, I've got the SpaceX job. Side note, the arrogance of him to lie about that, because, look, you're going to tell me that this, this kid right here is going to get a damn SpaceX job? Absolutely not wrong, eh, wrong, don't even buy it. Anyways, so he had to cover that up though. So then he's gonna say, well, I couldn't get down, I lost a job because I can't go long distances, I can't fly, the doctor said this. And it's just like, I mean, what you do get sawed in half and put back together again? I mean, this is unheard of. So I'm there talking to their mom and Chris. And I, um, then I go up, uh, have you know break down by their shed and they go swimming um, right by the swimming pool is the shed so they're they wanted to watch me like you know 
breakdown and all that. So after I noticed they're just watching, I just walk over to him. Describe your breakdown to me. Uh, I actually cried. <laughs> Started kicking grass. Just doing the toddler tantrum shit. I mean, come on, give me a break. Now, what's also interesting is looking at the level that he's lying here. You know, and first of all, so we heard from them what really happened, right? So we know what he's doing is he's out there disposing of the torso. Okay, and then he realizes they're watching him. And, and again, this is where I'm like, who in their right mind, I mean, we know he's not his right mind. Why would you think to go do that on their property with them there? I mean, what was he thinking? Part of me wonders, was he trying to set them up? Because he left everything there, right? So I'm like, how did he think he would get away with that? That kind of bizarre behavior. It's like your parents are missing. All this is going on. You go out there, you do this. I mean, it doesn't even add up to make any kind of sense. Um, then I hopped in the water with them. Okay. So it was too late. I was in the water. I didn't realize Crest didn't have a top, okay. um, and that was uncomfortable. But I talked to them more, and that's when she brought up the housing situation, how she doesn't like how my parents, like, are, I guess. I don't, I don't know. She doesn't, she doesn't know them that well. She never met them. Okay. Crest was saying that? And Kat's mom. You know, okay. Kat's mom is, uh, speaks his first thought right away. Yeah. So she's so they're offering me to get a job, live with them, work for them while I'm working, and pay rent. And that's kind of their their deal. I would have like a month free of rent, or a month or two maybe, if if they're thinking. Now you know full well whether this is true or not. That if say he ended up doing that, he would have probably done the same to them right the fact that he's gonna sit there number one and lie about the topless pool situation right i mean we know that that's not how that went down number two all the things he's saying where it's almost like he's trying to pen it like they didn't like the parents his parents you know so this is where i kind of go back to was this kid crazy enough to try and blame it on them i mean you have to ask yourself with him at this point right but also what's sad is look at how many people now you know probably left to their own they would be like oh god our daughter's dating a loser at this point you know but well, who knows 100 percent on that but the fact of how out of their way they're willing to go for him if that's true you know he could be lying about that to the cops you know because this is their daughter's boyfriend they're doing this and that well come live here come do this who knows what kind of picture he painted of the parents to them we were in a breakdown what were you having a breakdown about you ever have your legs are kind of yeah. No, I haven't. Just, okay. just, I don't even know if they're done eating like as bad as they they can be yet. So yeah. that's a uh, that's not fun. And you, I think you were telling me last night it was it's, it's a symptom of a concussion, right? So Is that right? that's not it. That's a, it's a symptom of nerve damage from the hit oh, to my spine. So okay. it's permanent. Okay, I understand that no better. Yeah. Um, so it's just legs. I think it's a waste feeling is probably colostomy bag down the road and all of that. But here we are Sunday. Yeah. Oh, okay, we're sitting in the pool, we're hanging out. Um they're just talking to me. The fact that he tries to tell the officer, have you ever had your legs? permanently damaged or whatever he was going to say we don't know right but you see the level of lying that he's doing right he does not have nerve damage he barely even had a concussion of that he's probably making that up too i mean the daughter's gonna basically sound like they needed to say something almost like this person wants to know to get out of school or work just write something my god so uh, we don't know if your dad got hurt no okay no but my best guess is that guy reached in the fireplace and cut off his arm or something. I don't know. Now here's where it starts to get freaky because he's like desperately trying to, I think desperately, answers to why there's probably blood all over the house, right? Or like places and that. What he did to the parents, there should be blood 
floor to ceiling in this home, right? So he's trying to come up with these reasons and this is where it just gets so creepy because it's so obvious that he's lying. I mean, the cops have seen this kind of stuff time and time again. You know, people lying, making stuff up and I'm sure they're just like, oh yeah, nah, yeah, 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 yeah. Those paper towels go just in the trash. Yeah. Um, some just everywhere in my car trash in my my trash yeah. um they ended up in the car trash there's a bag in the car that i carry around it's a car trash oh, okay. it's like a gallon bag okay that's more portable than the garbage can so yeah bloody rag after bloody rag just trying to get it all up and, mm -hmm. i don't know it was, it was a lot i I didn't feel sick, so it couldn't have been that much, right? Yeah, you didn't lose enough to pass over or anything. Now, during the segment we just watched, the, he is describing, Chandler, I mean, he is describing hurting his foot, his toe, whatever, when this glass broke, playing fetch with the dog, that's all alive. And so you're hearing him trying to come up with reasons as to bloody rags, bloody towels, all this kind of stuff. You would have him think, or he would have you think, just from the sounds of, oh, there's, good, there's bloody towels here, there's bloody this, there's bloody that. But I mean, it gets worse. And you hear the cops are entertaining this, right? They know, at this point, again, I've said it before, they know during this time that the parents, what's essentially happened to them, right? And that, you know, we ain't gonna convict him without a jury, but uh, he guilty so far, right? Is there any reason to believe mom or dad's blood would be somewhere in the house? Have they been injured at all that you're aware of? Well, my dad scratches his psoriasis till he, like, gushes blood. Okay. Gushing. Um, describe gushing to me. Enough to run down your leg, like, um, like, cover your leg, I suppose. Like, he has it on his knee. So when he does this, it just, like, drips oh, nice. down. Uh, I ask him to stop, but he doesn't do it when he's stressed out. Yeah. He, he just kind of like, it's his tech. He's, yeah, probably itches. Does he, um, like, does it enough to get on the floor? Does it leave? Oh, yeah. Yeah, like how much, like, before we were talking the water bottle lid and the Yeti lid, is there, I mean, like, are we talking puddles like that or just ribbons or? It could be enough. Okay. But I'm thinking Yeti lid if he's there and I don't catch him soon enough. Oh, jeez. Is there a reason why your parents' blood would be around the house? My dad scratches his psoriasis until it gushes blood. Okay. Okay. You know, and again, at this point, I try and slow my thoughts down. I'm like, Paul, he's making this up as he goes. He's like, they're sending him something, and he's like, okay, knock that one out. He thinks he did at least, right? But again, you just see the desperation. I'm just like, I, I mean, I, I get it. I know people with psoriasis. It's itchy. I understand that. You can definitely irritate that, scratch it until you get some blood. He is describing, I mean, we're talking about a grisly crime scene here, right? And so I'm just like, oh, but your dad will, if you're not there to stop him from doing that, he'll just... I guess, you know, scratch his psoriasis until he'll bleed out to death. My ma's blood, um, just from her bloody noses she gets sometimes when she wakes up. Uh, that's why we've been doing uh, the dehumidifier, or humidifier and dehumidifiers. Yeah, probably downstairs you get the We ha We have to do multiple of them, but she can't be in the living room too long because that's a dehumidifier. You yep. know, if she does, her nose gets bad. Not like a regular one. She gets it bad. Um, but she either goes to the kitchen to fix it, her vanity, or the bathroom. Now again, with the mother, her the reason for that is up oh, nosebleeds. Lucky she's even alive these days, right? So again, this is where it almost goes into this level of absurdity to where it's almost like this dark comedy. I'm just like, where, I mean, I, I'm almost begging for the cops to end it at a certain point because I'm like, you can't dig a hole any deeper than he has so far, right? Let's just reel this in because this is getting so far-fetched, right? It's almost like he is describing a bad plot to a B-grade movie. Um... Is there any reason to believe that in either one of their vehicles there would be any of their blood? Their vehicles? Yeah. 
or anybody's vehicle, let's say that. Um, maybe car trash. Mom's car trash would definitely, the past few days. My dad's car trash. Why would, um, why would they have blood in their car trashes? That's a damn good question that I would like to know too. Why would there be blood in their car trashes from the last few days? I'm very interested to see what Mr. Chandler has to say about this one. Unfortunately, there is nothing to say about this one, right? Because he just keeps up with all this stuff. He He's trying to cover up this evidence as he goes, right? And as I said before, it gets to a certain point of begging the officers on my side, like, please just stop that. And so this is what they begin to do. And it's very interesting to see him come unraveled. So I think it's time we start talking about what happened to your parents. Like the truthful version. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have like 20 pages of writing. We're going to start with a clean white piece of paper for you to start telling the truth. Okay. Why? Right, because listen, listen to me. This is the only chance you're going to have to tell us the truth. Okay. Okay. What we, listen, listen. I'm, I can't tell you what we know, but we know you're not telling us the truth. We know your parents are no longer with us. Okay. And we know the reason why. Okay. You need to tell the truth. There's, listen, listen. You need to tell the truth about what happened and just tell us why it happened. Okay? If something happened, if you were defending yourself or if you just uh, got fed up with stuff, you need to tell us the truth. Okay? This is your chance to tell us why. Okay? I'm not BSing you. Okay? So can we do that? Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, he was gonna he was gonna pretend to pass out. He's one of those that'll pretend to pass out when he can when his back's against the wall or start crying or one of those type like these just perpetual victims, right? And so you know, in this, the look on his face when when they said, "We know your parents aren't coming back," I was like, "Don't even try and act surprised." Like it, all the evidence that came out, it's like, dude just stick your hands out and be like, cuff me, right? There is nowhere else to go from there. Now this trial will be marked with other notable testimony from people that knew Chandler as well. Andrew Smith actually met Chandler while being stationed in Germany and playing video games online. So that's where they met. Now he, meaning Andrew, was in a wreck in Germany and had a head injury and ended up returning to the States. Remember how I said it seems like Chandler would pick other people's truths and add them to his story? Well, uh, do the math on that one. Now, Andrew would testify that he too understood Chandler to be, you know, installing solar panels, and he actually stayed with Chandler at his parents' home. They stayed in the basement, and Andrew would testify that he brought Chandler a gift, which was a gun. Now, sadly, this would be a gun that Chandler used to take his parents out, and that gun would be found in Cress's barn. Now, former childhood friends of Chandler's would also testify, and when they sat there and testified, testified about like you know memories of going you know swimming and frolicking at parks and all this kind of stuff right again these are places that seem to be forever tainted because the places that they were testifying that they've been to with Chandler before are where body parts were found eventually. Now his one friend Alex would take the stand and he would say, yeah, you know, Chandler was doing this volunteer for, um, you know, the scuba diving lie and he would bring items back that he said that he found and one of them was an adult toy. And I was like, why? I, I have so many questions about that. Why would you tell someone that? Where did it come from? We know it's a lie. Why would you tell your friend about that? So I was just like, what? Like this, I mean, I just can't with this trial. Okay, so there was that. But I mean, you, you literally hear all these other people getting on the stand. He would have another friend. She would get up there and also testify about being to the place where his mother's body parts were found not at the time but like they had visited there and again it's like why would you go to places that you i mean obviously he went there because he knew them right but why go there knowing that people could testify that you've been there before i mean it doesn't make any sense but again y'all saw him talking i ain't expecting much out of this one so now as you have seen by now nothing about chandler was true there was no diving there was no SpaceX job. There was no apartment. There was no real injuries. There was no any of this stuff. There's no school. There's no this. Nothing about him was true to anyone that knew him. Now, one of the truths that we heard the prosecution say and that we see take place is that on July 1st, between 3 and 5 p.m., 
that is when he would take the lives of his parents. He would start with his father. Now, the reason why this happened is all these things he's been lying about, you know, there's a lie to cover up, lie to cover up, lie, was getting ready to be exposed. His dad had been going back and forth and back and forth and in circles with Chandler and his school, trying to get transcripts, trying to get down to why isn't he in this program? Why isn't this coming through? Why can't we get a transcript? This is holding him up. This went on forever, okay? He had fake emails set up. He had burner phones set up. You name it, Chandler had done it and was literally corresponding in this circle of lies and then bringing his father into the loop. He was that brazen about it. One of the things that Chandler had done is in these emails that he set up, they were like Gmail accounts. So he's going back and forth with these people at school who constantly canceled the appointments. He would make an appointment with an admin to come in there to talk about his transcript. Well, then they would have to cancel because of this. And like I said, this went on for months and months and months. I mean, like for a very long time. If you've had experience with colleges and stuff, yes, things can go down south. I've never heard of something to this long, right? So eventually the dad is over it, right? Because also alongside of this, you know, Chandler had the $61,000 a year internship and all this, which I'm like, who, why would you, I mean, it doesn't even make sense, but, um, but you know what? He wasn't getting paid because, oh, this excuse and that excuse and things that would just be illegal, right? And so he's running his parents through the ringer on this. So his dad finally gets on the phone one day and speaks to a real person at the school. And he's like, we're going to get to the bottom of this. You know, let's get into it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to listen to bits of this phone call because the heartbreaking part to this is that you hear his father coming to the realization that his son is a total liar. Hi, um, I'm trying to get an appointment scheduled to meet with somebody um, to mainly just get a copy of a transcript and also a printed copy of a certificate that was earned and, and uh, you know, other degree verification. Okay. How, how, do, how do we get that done? So you hear all the stuff that he wants to get from Chandler, not from Chandler, from the school about Chandler. So this tells you how complicated this was, right? That Chandler had made it this complicated. So this is where Chandler's life begins to crumble and be exposed. Okay, for the degree, you have to download the duplicate uh, diploma form and send it in or the for the check or the money order of four dollars for the diploma to be mailed back to you. For the transcript, you have to go online and request it. Yeah, I tried requesting on online and we never got them. And I've spent I don't know how many times doing that and at eight bucks a piece, so I'm not willing to do that again. What what where why is that letting you request your transcript? What is it? It's not my system, it's your system, so don't ask me questions like that. Now you can hear the frustration in his father's voice and I commend the gentleman that he's talking to on the phone for being patient and going through all this with him because thank God he was to expose his son. Now again, the lies that Chandler had created, remember Chandler had all these fake emails set up and he would email from these emails to his dad sometimes or forward them and whatnot or show them to his father. Another sad thing that we'll learn throughout this is that on one of the notes his dad made, Chandler had a burner phone set up that was a fake phone number to another person at the school or whatever. And his dad would even make note that this person sounds exactly like Chandler on the phone. And so Chandler was ballsy enough to sit there and pretend to be on the phone with somebody and talk to his own father. That's how deep he was willing to go to create this fake life. I'm going through the process before I worked with, um, you know, I had I tried to work with Daniel Spike to see if he can get through the information. I don't, believe, I don't know if he's with you guys anymore, but it just seems like the ball keeps getting dropped. And the world that Chandler created for him, it does keep getting dropped. Chandler makes sure of that. Hold on, let me look at your account first, okay? Where is your ID number or social? So I can access your account. No, I don't have that. Now this is where it's getting ready to all come crumbling down. Once they get into his account and they start piecing everything together, I bet his dad's mouth was on the ground. Okay, so it looks like you owe a balance. You owe a balance of 2,349. 
So that's what he's, that's why you can't request it. Now I bet his dad's heart sank right there because you know that's the tip of the iceberg. But just hearing the amount and you know all this money and that's why. Because typically what they're describing, I've done this before, it's not a difficult system. There's usually something holding it up like this. And so that's why it strikes me that Chandler was able to play this off for as long as he could, you know, for absolutely driving his father crazy over this, right? So at that first thing right there, I'm sure his dad was just like, what? But it keeps getting worse. Is there a person there, an office I can go to and have them do it? Yeah, someone can walk you through. They can show you how to obtain it. And the same as, you know, if you call, we can walk you through. You download your own official transcript. But like I said, the balance have to be taken care of first. Yes, I, okay, I understand that part. What haunts me is to hear his dad say things like, is there someone I can come down there and do this with? I don't think anyone would ever anticipate that their child would take things to the degree that Chandler did, first of all, online. Secondly, what he did to them. If you've earned a certificate, say, in that solar program, you said, where does that get requested to? If you earned a certificate? Yeah. I don't. I don't see that you earned a certificate. Uh, there were, there were no, like... This is the next place that I'm sure his dad was like, what? I mean, can you imagine being on the phone and finding out I don't have this certificate? Because this is going to be, everything's, you know, it's layered. Well, if he doesn't have the certificate, then he couldn't be doing this. Let me see where I'm going with that. You were taking IT classes, right? I don't see that you were in the program. Again, keeps getting worse. You're not in the program. Not even in the program. Now again, and I'll put, if I haven't put them up already, I'll put them up. When they start showing the evidence of the classes and stuff, you can tell where Chandler started off taking some stuff, but also you can then see where he was flunking out. It looked like he was signing up for stuff, maybe getting financial aid or something like that. Who knows exactly? Definitely taking his parents' money. And then just withdrawing and flunking out of classes. But I don't see that you were admitted in any program. And again, as they dig deeper, it just becomes more obvious. He wasn't in any program. He had never been admitted to it. He was just taking random classes. But he would have you think he had just gotten a job at Space DMX. You said they were, you know, it's the IT degrees in there, right? No, those, those are just classes. Like, you took general education classes and then, and then the IT classes. Uh, you might have just took the classes but not be in the program. And it makes me wonder during this time if he knew what was going on, the counselor, the admissions person, because it just sounds so obvious where his dad's like, well, what about the IT program? I mean, it's just, it, it breaks my heart for them to realize that in these final days, hours, minutes of his life, it was this realization of my own flesh and blood has done this to me. Is the internship from the spring shop in there? Entrance of... From the spring of what year, I can go back. Oh, this year, 2021. Winter. Yeah, you do spring. No. That one had to be painful, because again, Chandler gave himself a $61,000 a year internship that he never got paid for. You know, <laughs> just like, now also what's interesting is his dad's an accountant, and so I'm sure that had to be one where all these lies were going on of why they couldn't pay him, and oh, it was this. I mean, he showed correspondences that again, Chandler made all this up. Chandler would misspell words. He would have this person leaving on vacation at the last minute. I mean, he made up such a line of BS that again any parent because you're not thinking your child would go to these links to avoid you know doing anything but Chandler did and none of it made sense do you know do you have a, uh, an Alyssa Brandt that works in uh, that area or anywhere in the campus uh, what is the last name B-R-A-N I think it's T or D-T now this is where he begins to realize that even the people he's been talking to aren't real and have never worked at the college. How about, does Daniel Spice still work there? Spice, last name is Spice, yeah, it's, um... Again, 
deeper and deeper the p the bs gets piled none of these people work there none of these correspondences were true and i wonder if in this moment he realized wait that was chandler i was on the phone with now of course this phone call all of this realization would lead to the father making an appointment to go down to the school which was on july 1st like we discussed and it would seem that chandler would have had a choice on that day you know, I'm not trying to deny that he was going to get an ass chewing, right? I get that. I would have been not looking forward to that, right? What kid would, you know, young adult, I should say. I keep calling him a kid. But to then decide the only choice was to obliterate his parents off the face of this earth, I, I it, it blows my mind. The amount of work that Chandler put into not working and doing anything is insane. If he had put half the effort into actually doing some of this stuff, none of this would be anywhere. None of this would have happened. Now, after a solid case presented by the state, there's really nothing left to say. And their closing was very much like the beginning of the case, the opening. It was precise, it was concise, it was to the point, and it really hit home. So every case that comes in is kind of like a puzzle. You have to look at it, because obviously you weren't there. But, you know, solving a case and thinking about whether or not a person is guilty or not guilty is like putting together a puzzle. And it's your job as the jury to put that puzzle together. But the question in this case, or why this case is kind of unique, is the person who committed the crime had eight days to spread the pieces of that puzzle all over the state of Wisconsin. The state would deliberate for just a little bit over two hours, and they would come back with all guilty verdicts and all charges. There's really nothing else you could have come back with after the case was presented. It was such a slam dunk kind of a case. Again, this is one of those where my heart goes out to his parents, to the brother, to the girlfriend, to Crest to Dulce. All these people that Chandler affected and destroyed their lives over. Something so crazy that was all created by himself. He just seems like someone who had absolutely nothing going for him, but also absolutely no care for human life or anyone else around him. I don't believe that he cared about his girlfriend. I don't believe he cared about anybody else but himself because you don't draw people into this dark, scary web that he did if you do care about them on any level. I'm sure these people are going to take years, if not a lifetime, to get over the things that they know happened to their loved one, to their friend, to the nice receptionist, you know, at the store they went to, to the friendly accountant that helped them with their taxes. This pain and horror will reach out for a lifetime for many people. Now, that is the grisly tale of Chandler Halderson. I'm glad you sat here with me. If you're still sitting here watching, I appreciate it. Again, I just, I can't see enough. My heart goes out to these people. I'm so, it's just, I, I can't imagine. This case, watching this was like really, it really just kind of like hit my core because I was like, this is horrible. The same kind of feeling that I got from Grand Amato, Joel Guy Jr., where it's, it's senseless, right? There's just, and it's so over the top, gruesome and barbaric. You know, you just, you, you wonder why this has happened. So anyways, again, my heart goes out to everybody. Thank you for watching. And until we meet at the sofa again, I'll see you soon.